to get us started on today's content. Thanks, Kayla. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, home ownership webinar. Um, just wanted to go over a couple quick things in case you've missed any of our past presentations and want to view them. They're all available on the HUD Exchange. Um, uh, this is our first one for 2022, and as Kayla mentioned, we're always looking for new topics. Several of the past ones have been uh, based off of uh, audience suggestions, so if there's anything you're looking for, please feel free to send it our way. All right, what are we doing here today? So uh, this is a little bit broader and a little bit um, slightly different than our, our past topics, which have really been focused on Section 9 to Section 8 definition of repositioning. This is, uh, I would call this advanced repositioning, right? We're going to talk about how housing authorities can, you know, uh, further expand the um, affordable home ownership in their communities through uh, federal assistance uh, and different federal housing programs. And so we're going to go over a bunch of the of HUD's tools to get there, including housing counseling, Section 8Y, Section 32, public housing capital funds, and choice neighborhoods. Um, of course, we'll talk about some of the repositioning strategies to get there as well. And we have a group of great presenters today. Um, Jane Hornstein, who many of you have, have heard before on our past topic, on our past presentations, Kathy Sibist, um, both of whom are with the Special Applications Center, Kristen Arnold uh, from the Office of Public Housing and Voucher Programs. Um, and who used to live very close to me here in Portland, Oregon, but is now a DC resident, and Chris Granger from the Office of Capital Improvements. Um, also on the line, we have Sue Wilson, um, the director of the Urban Revitalization Urban Revitaliz, Re, Urban Revitalization Division, um, Belinda Bly, and Jennifer Rainwater from the Moving to Work Demonstration Program. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Jane. Jane. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Kayla, for getting this all set up, too. Um, today's webinar, we're going to look at two different parts of home ownership. Um, the first part we're going to look at is how do we develop and we work with our families to get them ready for home ownership, which is the demand side. And then we'll later go into what you as PHAs can do to increase the supply, supply of home ownership um, units. Uh, given your inventory, et cetera, and what assets you have available to you. So we're going to go ahead and start with uh, how do we get our families ready, and I'm going to turn it over to Chris for a minute um, to go ahead and get us started. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, uh, I'm Chris Granger from the Office of Capital Improvements, and I'm going to talk about housing counseling and about the eligible uses of capital funds. So first, let's go ahead and talk about housing counseling, and I'm so happy to do it because housing counseling is so important for home ownership. This is important for a variety of reasons. I'm sure you can guess most of them. This is important because um, you have some residents who are thinking of becoming homeowners, um, and also you have residents who are becoming homeowners, and even once they become homeowners, they still could benefit from counseling because once the resident becomes a homeowner, um, they are no longer the landlord, so they can't call the landlord to uh, do maintenance and things like that. So it helps them with um, with budgeting, with credit repair, with uh, down payment. And um, this is something that housing counseling agencies can provide. So um, uh, I guess the you know home ownership is a is a beautiful thing and it comes with a lot of responsibility and um the housing counseling agencies can help our residents rise to the occasion and that's what we want to see um housing counseling uh the question is is housing counseling required for home ownership programs and i think um we know that in many cases the answer is yes but not always so um it it kind of depends and you want to check on um what you're actually approved for the, uh, we want to always encourage housing counseling, though, either way. And I think it's important, too, to remember that um, the housing counseling is not just for homeowners. Um, this is for renters, for homeless, for disaster victims. Um, you know, at HUD, we do a lot of uh, d disaster deployment, and housing counseling agencies are were vital for the assistance to the survivors of disasters, talking about, like, hurricanes and floods, too. So 
um, want to make sure that housing authorities are able to, you know, encourage this and able to be, you know, support the um, interaction between the public, the residents, and the housing counseling agencies. Um, this slide shows the map on the right. You can see that. That's, a, that's an interactive map on our website. And when you click on the state, you will get a list of the um, housing counseling agencies that are available. And uh, it's pretty interactive and um, would, would like to encourage housing authorities that are interested in home ownership to have relationships with these agencies and so that they can um, collaborate and uh, refer residents. But just in general, these, these, are, these are helpful things to know. And, um, you know, again, we always want to encourage this. We want to move to the next slide to talk about capital assistance uh, to families. So let's talk about capital funds. Everyone knows, I think, the basics of capital funds. Um, capital funds provide funds to PHAs for development, financing, and modernization of public housing developments. The um, capital fund basics, we typically receive around $2.7 billion annually, uh, which can change because it's subject to appropriations. These funds are divided and awarded to PHAs based on a formula that takes into account many factors, but largely the more units a housing authority has, the more funds they're going to have. And um, housing authorities have, upon award, two years to obligate these funds. So that means two years to essentially contract them or to have some kind of obligating document, and four years to expend the funds. So um, there is a ticking clock on capital funds. So you want to make sure that these are obligated and that you report in locks, which I know all of you are doing, but I always want to uh, give that reminder. Um, these funds are... Uh, to use capital funds for any eligible project. Um, it's important to remember that these funds uh, can only cover projects that are in the five-year action plan. So that means that the housing authority would enter that into the EPIC system. The five-year action plan, remember, is no longer on paper. It's all done in the EPIC system. You all should have familiarity with EPIC, but if not, that's okay. Let your field office know and we can get you set up. Mostly capital funds um, are used for modernization of public housing units. That's typically what we um, see across the country, but um, capital funds can be used to support um, other programs too. Like it doesn't have to be just for modernization. So that's why we're talking about capital funds used for home ownership. Um, it's important to remember though that capital funds must su uh, support public housing and not any other programs. Um, it's important to remember, you know, how capital funds are are used properly because um, if funds are used improperly, they can be recaptured and the housing authority can be subject to sanction. The, uh, the regulations at 24 CFR 905 provide for a myriad of uses um, outside traditional modernization, including home ownership. So we're so happy to support this function through capital funds. And when it comes to home ownership, um, you know, capital fund doesn't drive the process, but we provide, we're happy to provide funding for the process. Um, one of the uses of capital funds that's really important to remember is the down payment assistance, closing costs, and counseling. Um, these are just some of the eligible homeownership costs. Um, we're talking about, the, I think, more of the demand side. And when we get into the supply side later in the presentation, we're going to cover some others. Um, and so now I want to turn things over to my esteemed colleague, Kristen Arnold, in the Office of Public Housing and Vouchers. Thank you, Kristen. You have the floor. Thanks, Chris. Okay. So hello, everyone. This is Kristen Arnold, and I work on the voucher side. Um, and I'm going to provide you with a high-level overview of how the homeownership voucher works. So these are the vouchers that the PHA can provide to families to assist them in paying um, their home ownership expenses. Next slide. So the home ownership option is not a separate pot of funding. Uh, these are vouchers that are included under the AAC, so you need to plan for it. The PHA identifies this as a program in the annual plan and then outlines how it will work in the admin plan. The PHA must demonstrate that they have capacity to operate a successful program. 
and then the PHA meets this requirement by establishing financing standards that are equal to the criteria set in the regulation listed on the slide. So in practice, this means that when an assisted family goes to buy a home, it's the PHA's responsibility to ensure that their financing for the mortgage and loan that the family is getting outside of the PHA meets the minimum standard. And this is done to protect the HUD investment and the family. So the PHA is looking at things like, is the mortgage provided and insured by the state or federal government? And does it comply with standard underwriting procedures and practices? If the PHA chooses not to adopt the regulatory financing standard, they must otherwise demonstrate in the annual plan that it has capacity or will acquire the capacity to successfully operate a Section 8 homeownership program. So these are the things that you need to establish before offering and assisting families with homeownership vouchers. Next slide. So let's talk about program design. Operating this program requires some basic knowledge of how homeownership financing works. And then the regulations allow PHAs broad flexibility in tailoring their programs. So how do you set your program up for success? It's important to look at the big picture, like the population you serve and their barriers to homeownership entry. Um, you would look at the housing market in your community and what's available, how expensive is it, what other local homeownership initiatives are happening in your area. And so all of these things are important to think about when developing your local homeownership option program. And then you would think about operations. So who will your program partners be that provide the homeownership education, financing, and counseling to your families? How long do you want to give applicants time to search and secure financing? What are the parameters you want to put on the program regarding savings and financial literacy? Do you want to limit participation to families who are current voucher holders or to families who are participants in or have graduated from an SSS program? Administering a successful HCV homeownership program requires BHAs to establish and nurture partnerships with lenders, counseling agencies, and other nonprofit investors in their community. The homeownership-related work is not part of the PHA's staff traditional job duties. Staff that manage the program must understand the homeownership process and the requirements that a participating family must satisfy in order to qualify for the assistance. To enter the homeownership market, a family needs to have savings, regular employment, and a high enough credit for to obtain a conventional mortgage. And down payment and closing costs can be a significant barrier for first-time and low-income home buyers. The PHA's jurisdiction must also have an inventory of houses available that are not only affordable for the program participants, but also meet HQS. So administering the program is a little different than providing rental assistance, and it's important that the program design is feasible for your local community. Next slide. So let's talk about who qualifies. Um, a family may be newly admitted or an existing HCV participant. Applicants are still selected from the PHA's voucher program waiting list in accordance with the standard selection policies outlined in the admin plan. You cannot keep a separate waiting list for just qualified homeownership eligible applicants, and you may not provide a selection preference to applicant families on the basis of their interest in or eligibility for homeownership. You can combine this program with TPVs as long as vouchers, the vouchers and the families meet each of the program's requirements. And this would be considered a selection outside of the waiting list that's covered by the special admissions section of the rule. Uh, if this is something you're interested in, make sure you're working closely with your HUD contacts to ensure the use of the vouchers under these circumstances is allowable. We encourage you to be creative and strategic with homeownership and blending all of these HUD programs, um, but make sure you do your due diligence because it can get really complicated. Families are required to meet the same HCD eligibility requirements but have additional criteria. There are minimum income and employment criteria. At the time the family begins receiving homeownership assistance, the adult family must not earn less than the federal minimum hourly wage. So right now that's about 725, and if you multiply by 2,000 hours, that's about $14,500 annually. And for a disabled family, the adult family members who own the home must have an annual income of not less than the monthly federal supplemental security income benefit for an individual living alone multiplied by 12. So that's about $9,500. So these are pretty low. Um, the PHA may establish minimum income requirements higher than the HUD standard for either or both types of families. 
based on factors such as the local housing costs and or the practices of local lenders. Remember that the family must be able to secure a mortgage loan for the purchase of a home. In addition to meeting the income requirement, one or more adult member of the family who will own the home must both be employed on a full-time basis, so an average of not less than 30 hours a week, and been continuously employed for the year prior to the beginning of homeownership assistance. And then the PHA can set their own policy regarding what is considered continuously employed. The employment requirements do not apply to elderly and disabled families, but the PHA may not adopt any additional employment requirements to families um, who are not elderly or disabled. So in addition to the minimum income and employment standard, the family must also be a first-time homeowner, as defined in the regulation, not defaulted in the past on a mortgage tied to an AY-assisted home. They must not have any other homeownership interest, but there are some exceptions in the regulation. And they must complete the pre-assistance homeownership um, and housing counseling. And then the PHA can add any additional eligibility requirements. And then remember that the lenders can, um, they can have any income and employment requirements they want. So it's especially advisable for voucher home buyers to meet with a lender sooner rather than later in the home buying process. Next. Okay, so units, types of units that you can assist. It must be owner occupied and pass HQS. They can be single family houses. Um, they can be single dwelling, a single dwelling unit in a co-op or condominium development, or a manufactured home um, that is permanently installed on land that will be owned by the family. The family is not required to own fee title to the property as long as the home is located on a permanent foundation, and they have the right to occupy the home site for at least 40 years. So this allows for more flexible home ownership models, including community land trusts and the co-ops and condominiums and things like that. You can assist PHA-owned units. The PHA would make this determination by applying the definition of a PHA-owned unit at the time of sale. And then if the unit meets that definition, then the PHA would need to inform the family that they have the right to purchase any eligible unit they want. And a PHA-owned unit is freely selected by the family without PHA pressure or steering. And if they do sell a PHA-owned unit, then they must hire an independent agency to conduct the HQS review the independent inspection report, review the contract of sale, determine the reasonableness of the sale price, and any PHA provided financing. And these address any conflict of interest issues that might arise and protect the tenant. Families can purchase a unit that is not built yet or under construction as long as the environmental review is complete and the assistance isn't, and the assistance isn't provided until after the unit is complete. Units purchased under a lease purchase agreement may be eligible for rental assistance prior to the actual sale, and then for home ownership assistance after the unit has been sold. So you could do a lease purchase model, but you'd be like splitting the rental assistance voucher and then the home ownership assistance voucher. Home ownership assistance may not be used to purchase a property that includes other residential or commercial space that will be leased by the homeowner. So you couldn't help purchase like a shop home where they have a shop on the bottom and they live on the top. Um, the family must give the PHA a copy of the contract of sale, and the PHA must review it to make sure it meets the criteria specified in the regulation. And a homeownership voucher cannot be used to assist healthcare facilities like nursing homes, school dormitories, or other public or private institutions. This is similar to vouchers. Next. So how much will the PHA pay, and are the calculations different for rental assistance? So once the family has been determined as qualified, and provided a voucher, they're going to get a monthly payment to assist them with home ownership expenses. In the rule, they do talk about down payment assistance, but the funding has never actually been allocated. So this is a program that only pays kind of like a monthly home ownership assistance subsidy. There's no down payment assistance. The DHA uses the same payment standard schedule, payment standard amount, and subsidy standards as the rental voucher program. But where it differs is the HAP payment. In the Home Ownership Voucher Program, the housing, assistance, the housing assistance payment is equal to the lower of the payment standard or the actual monthly home ownership expenses through the unit minus the total tenant payment. So you look at the two criteria and use the lesser. Home ownership expenses are defined in the regulation and then the PHA adapts the policy on how they determine them. There are specific criteria for what can be included, so make sure you check the regs when you're identifying the home ownership expenses to use. 
Most elements of the home ownership expenses are based on the family's actual expenses or allowances that the PHA has already established. So a few examples are included in home ownership. A few examples that would be included in the home ownership expense calculation would be the PHA utility allowances for the unit, mortgage insurance premiums, um, principal and interest on the mortgage debt incurred, family's payments. There's a list. So the monthly HAP payment can be paid either to the lender or directly to the family. And if the assistance payment exceeds the amount due to the lender, the PHA must pay the excess directly to the family. There is no HAP contract, but there is a standard home ownership obligation form that must be signed. Next slide. Okay. So after they've been assisted and you've established the payment standard, um, here's what happens ongoing. The PHA cannot impose or enforce any requirement for the recapture of the voucher home ownership assistance on the sale of or refinancing of the home purchased under the home ownership option. So the money, the money won't come back and cannot come back like in other sum HUD programs. Families who participate in the voucher home ownership program are required to complete annual and interim reexaminations in, according, in accordance with the PHA's program policies. Um, but unlike the rental assistance program, there is a floor payment standard. So once the family has closed on a home under the program, the payment standard that is used at the annual reexamination is the higher of the current payment standard that would otherwise apply to the family or the payment standard amount used for the family at the commencement of the homeownership assistance. There are term limits on this assistance, unlike in the rental assistance program. So for families who finance their purchase with a mortgage that has a 20-year term or longer, the maximum term of homeownership assistance is 15 years. For families with shorter mortgage, mortgage terms than 20 years, the maximum is 10 years. These limits do not apply to elderly or disabled families, but for some families, this assistance will end and they will need to be prepared to take over the full payment. The program allows for the same portability and termination requirements as regular HCB, and the family may move from, home, from a homeownership voucher to a rental assistance voucher as long as they remain eligible for the rental assistance voucher. So, this is the basic overview of the AOI program, and I think I'm passing it back to Jane, I believe, um, and I will take questions at the end of the presentation. Thanks, so, everybody. Chris, you know what? Thank you, Kristen and Chris both. Um, this has been really helpful. I think before we move into the supply side program, um, we do have some questions that came up either on um, the 8Y program or the CAP fund program and the housing counseling. So I'm gonna, I know Kayla has some of those. Um, and there was one in the chat for Chris in terms of the regulation he cited. So I, I'll- Sure, can I, uh, I don't think I see the yeah. chat. Yeah, Chris. go ahead. Can, can you read the question to me? Yeah, it was just, um, can you please repeat the regulation citation that Chris mentioned in the capital fund discussion? Oh, sure, it's, it's uh, 24 CFR 905. Okay, great, I also just, um, we'll put that in the chat momentarily. Okay, so on to the next question. Um, what are some of the pros and cons of a home ownership program for PHAs? So maybe we should defer this one until we get through the next section. Well, no, that's, well, in okay. terms of this, this is helping residents. What we've talked about so far is just helping residents prepare to become homeowners themselves. Um, and, and it's a way for housing authorities in, you know, to, to, to actually move into the homeownership market. I mean, these are, these are programs that can, you can use to do that. Um, clearly, not all residents are going to be ready to be homeowners. Um, but this, you know, the counseling in itself can be a way to just help them get ready um, to think about it, to think about how they want to move into homeownership, if they do or maybe they don't. Um, but it helps them with credit repair, et cetera. Um, so important life lessons. Um, I think, you know, if you are going to do an 8Y program, um, uh, 
Oh, it's, it's, Are you talking about these cut out? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. There was a couple of questions coming up in the chat box that I was like looking at at the same time. Um, so I think those are good things. I think in terms of the 8Y program, things that you should know is that you should clearly work with a lender. You should have a mortgage lender that understands your program and knows what you're going to do and is willing to accept these mortgages. Um, they can be your best partners in doing these as well as if you have an active housing counseling agency in your area. Um, but definitely get lenders to do this. There are lenders across the country that have worked on 8Y programs, know them, and want, want to help. So um, identifying those lenders early is helpful. Okay, um, I'm going to, Kayla, do you want to go ahead and ask some of these questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go into the, the rest. Um, I'm starting from the beginning. I know a bunch just came in, but I'm just going to start with the ones that I got throughout the presentation. Um, so first, can CAP fund be used to fund a down payment for a property under con under conversion to RAD? This assumes following the RAD conversion, the property will no longer be in the Housing Authority's inventory. Okay, so that may not be necessarily a home ownership question. Um, it sounds like a general RAD question. And so there's a lot of guidance about use of capital funds for RAD. And um, essentially, capital funds can be used um, for before the units convert to RAD. The capital, capital funds can be used just like any other public housing. And then if they're going to be used for any activities after they convert to RAD, it needs to be part of the uh, RAD financing plan. And so these are going to be uh, approved outside of the capital fund. These are approved um, by the by the RAD folks. So um, if this is part of the RAD financing plan, then, then our office will support it. So I think this is, this is Sue Wilson, and I think the question probably goes to um, there's going to be a transfer of assistance, um, which is going to leave those particular uh, units, the PHA will turn them into home ownership units and then sell them to residents. It sounds like that's what's going on. So in that case, I believe that the answer would be yes um, if, you know, all the other um, home ownership criteria are yes, uh, are uh, in the affirmative, um, then if the family is a public housing family, then you you likely would be able to use capital funds or down payment assistance. And we'll talk about that on the support side as well. Okay, okay. great. Next question. Um, does HUD offer trainings for the home ownership program? I think AY, for AY, they, they do not. We're working on getting our materials and resources um, revised and, and sent out, and it is on our radar to support um, the AY program and provide technical assistance in the field. So um, as of now, no. Um, and I've also searched, I think, other national entities that do AY, and it, they're actually quite hard to find. So um, we're aware that that is a gap. Um, that we are trying to build. Okay, great. Next question, if there's nothing else um, to answer on that one. Um, can you explain title again as it relates to community land trust? Um, so I, my understanding is with a community land trust, what happens is, is that the land trust purchases the land in the building, and they do whatever renovations they plan to do, then they actually sell the building only to the family, usually at a prearranged um, sale price. So in other words, they, they arrange upfront, part of the deal is that they will sell it to the resident at X dollars, and then when the resident goes to sale, there's a formula to which the, what the resident takes or the homeowner takes 
as their portion of the equity and what the how, the land trust keeps. But they can and they can either sell the the building again to another qualified buyer or back to the land trust. But at all times the land trust still maintains the land. That's my understanding. Yeah, that there's different models to do it across the country, but that's that's the basics of it. And it's for the AY I mean what's important to know for the AY program is that you can do that. You can have different home ownership models where um, you know there's a trust that owns the land underneath and it isn't um, you know, fee simple absolute ownership with the homeowner. Um, same thing with co-ops. So um, it can be a little more complicated. Make sure you're talking to your field office, um, but it, it, there is space for that. Okay, thanks. Next question. Um, and I don't, I don't know if this is maybe for later because it's related to section 32, but um, yeah, in section 32, okay. We can just, we'll hold that yeah. one um, and I'll just move on to the next one. One waiting list for all to participate in this program. There's not a separate waiting list, correct? For AY? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's the same waiting list. Okay, great. Uh, so next one, another a AY. Um, if I am understanding this correctly, Assisting current voucher holders to become homeowners is either through AY or capital funds. So I guess it's both, actually. Can you repeat that? Yes, sorry. Um, if I'm understanding this correctly, assisting current voucher holders in becoming homeowners is either through AY or using capital funds. Um, yeah, I mean, you, if you're, you, you can be a current voucher holder or selected from the wait list um, to receive a home, home ownership voucher. Right. So. And, and we'll also get into the Section 32 program in the next section, and that could be another way to assist public housing and other families um, with home ownership. Okay. Thank you. Next, we have quite a few more, about eight more. Um, do you still want to go ahead, Jane? Um, let me do just a couple of others. Um, okay. Since they were, um, um, okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, do you have any examples of other criteria PHAs have implemented that clients must meet to be on the home ownership program? A lot of PHAs tie this to their FSS program, um, just because that is a good, um, they have the savings and the support to kind of work on what is needed to get a loan. Um, so there's things like that, but off the top of my head, that's all I can think of. But I think when you partner with other agencies, you know, you might want to look at their criteria. That's one thing to think about. Um, so you can have that same tie. Okay. Okay, next. Um, can you explain more about switching back to a rental voucher with home ownership? Yeah, so um, we've had this question a couple of times where they, a family has purchased a home and been assisted with an AY voucher and then, um, you know, during, whether it's during the term of the assistance or at the end of the term, um, it, they find that it's just not going to work for them anymore. So as long as they remain eligible for rental assistance, you, they can continue to be supported with a rental voucher, but it would need to, you know, you need to rent a unit. So they would have to sell their home and move or um, sell their home and rent it from the new owner. So there's nothing like special about it. It's, it's just saying that sometimes that that can happen.
Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, there's a few others on the 8Y that we should just get through um, specifically. Um, can an 8Y program be applied to a co-op? Yes. Okay. Easy. Um, you may have covered this, but how is a monthly condo maintenance fee or other home ownership association fee covered under the Section 8Y program? So those are considered the homeownership expenses that are considered when you're um, identifying, calculating the HAP payment. So it, it basically is included when you're identifying um, how much you're going to pay. So it's not, it, it, it's just all included in that amount and it's considered a homeownership expense. Okay, awesome. I think this is a related one. Uh, can you clarify the HAP calculation? Payment standard minus the total tenant payment? I feel like that's a detailed question. I can do that. I can send that out afterwards, I think, just to make sure that I get it correctly and provide okay. good guidance. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, could, are there, or do you have a list of lenders who are friendly to and helpful in these programs? We are working on it. Uh, Chief Wright is working on it, so I will. Um, I can also follow up when we send out the slides and see where we're at with that. Okay. And to that point, um, are there any additional educational materials that PAH offers to PHAs to share with prospective lending partners? That we are also working on. So it's coming. That's definitely coming. Um, but we're not there yet. It, we're the um, our program support division is working on those. So. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I think I think that's good for now. There's a, a few more, but uh, why don't we go ahead and, and move on, Jane? What do you think? Okay. All right. So let's go on to the supply side now. Um, we're going to talk about the various programs that you can use using public housing units and land. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Stevens to start us off talking about land. Great, thanks Jane. Um, good afternoon everyone. Um, happy to be here with you today. So we get this question a lot. Housing authorities um, might have excess vacant land that is under a DOT that they never developed. It might be adjoining an existing project. It might be um, just vacant land after a HOPE 6 demolition or, or Section 18 demolition many years ago. Um, but regardless, they're sitting on some vacant public housing property that's under a DOT. And they're talking to community partners and, and they're thinking about how the, the best use of this property might be home ownership development, um, market rate, affordable, um, just more home ownership supply in their communities. So. The simplest way and the most straightforward way to um, work with a development partner to develop vacant land as home ownership units is to transfer or sell it to that developer at fair market value. Um, in this case, there's, SAC is not going to put any use restrictions on it. Um, it. You just submit a Section 18 application. Clearly, you can evidence that the, the land is vacant and excess. So. Um, you meet a justification under Section 18, um, and the housing authority is made whole with the proceeds um, and can use them in accordance with our proceeds notice, um, PIH notice 2020-23. Um, so this is definitely the most straightforward path to allowing for uh, home ownership units on your uh, vacant land. Um, if you are working with nonprofits, and other partners and your plan and hope and goal is to develop the land as affordable home ownership, then you could um, propose to the SAC that you want to transfer the property to the nonprofit or developer at below fair market value. In this case, um, the housing authority is going to need to evidence a commensurate public benefit. Many of you are aware of that test under our um, disposition 970 rule. Um, we're going to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis, um, and it, it's a pretty high threshold. Um, 
and at a minimum, we'll, we'll want to look for a recorded use agreement on the property, um, possibly even a reverter, depending on, you know, what the housing authority and developer come up with, to make sure this vacant land is developed and sold um, as affordable home ownership units to families. Um, the other option here I'll just throw in there, which is a little bit more convoluted, is housing authority always has the option to develop um, units on vacant land, um, develop low rent public housing units on vacant land under the 905 development rules. Um, but in order to do this, you would need the fair cost authority to, um, to develop those new low rent public housing units. But once those existing units are developed, you could then sell them under a section 32 plan. But um, that, that is definitely not as straightforward as, as selling the vacant land to a developer um, for a homeownership unit. Okay, next, I think I'm turning it back over to Chris. Thank you so much. Um, so let's talk about some more capital fund uses. Um, these are outlined in the Capital Fund Guidebook, which is available online. Um, that's really easy to find. You just go to um, your favorite search engine and you type Capital Fund Guidebook and that'll come up. Um, these are also supported by the regulations at 24 CFR 905 that I mentioned earlier. So um, we just want to make a reminder here that these are eligible activities um, that support homeownership activities. but um, all obligation and expenditure requirements must still be um, included, uh, must still be adhered to, and um, these also must be in the approved five-year action plan in EPIC and the annual statement within EPIC. Uh, just want to make sure that it's clear that um, the capital fund supports these activities, um, but we still have to adhere to the process of the capital fund. And that also includes complying with 2 CFR 200. Um, that means that um, when you obligate and expend funds on any of these activities, we want to make sure that we adhere to procurement and grant management and contract management requirements. Um, so some of these activities are general to the capital fund, and we see these in many cases, um, and they also apply to homeownership. And then you'll notice that some of these activities are very specific to homeownership only. So um, let's get into it. We can cover some specific home ownership functions like down payment assistance, closing costs, um, home ownership counseling, credit counseling. And as Kristen mentioned earlier, it's very important to know if your program is feasible for your community. So uh, we use CAP funds to run a study of the feasibility uh, that will test whether the feasibility of the program meets the needs of the PHA and the community and whether the program is reasonable and capable of being carried out. We can uh, use CAP funds for rehab and development of units, and that's pretty standard for capital fund, whether it's home ownership or any other um, use within public housing. Um, but these are this is very important for home ownership, and this can cover construction, acquisition, with or without rehab. Um, even can cover the demolition to support um, development related to home ownership. Um, we can cover site improvements as well, so not just the units, but you can cover the entire development. Capital funds can cover uh, relocation costs. Um, these can be, they can cover soft costs like admin and marketing costs. And of course, as always, capital funds can cover the abatement of environmentally hazardous materials. Remember that the housing authority must be in compliance with the environmental requirements of 2 CFR, excuse me, 24 CFR um, 58, uh, parts 50 and 58, and also notice 2016-22. Um, these are the environmental requirements, and oftentimes the environmental review done by the responsible entity will note that certain environmental mitigations must occur as part of the project if this is the case capital funds can pay for these mitigations. Um, so remember to include them in your five-year action plan. Um, now I will turn things back over to Jane and Kathy. So please take it away. 
Thank you, Chris. Um, so we're gonna get back into a little bit of the weeds of the Section 32 program. So this program, it's um, administered by the SAC um, and it's a program that's primarily used by PHAs to sell existing low rent public housing units. That said, there's also a way that a housing authority can use the Section 32 program to go out and acquire new units. Um, with 1937 Act funds, with proceeds from previous home ownership sales, or even with non-1937 Act funds, and then sell them um, under a Section 32 program. Um, if, if a plan, Section 32 proposal to the SAC does involve acquisition of, um, of units that are not currently low rent public housing, then the field office reviews and approves an acquisition proposal as part of that Section 32 plan. Um, so again, it can be used primarily to sell existing low rent public housing units, um, a, a mostly single family is what we've seen in the past, but as we'll get into in a, in a few minutes, there's a way to sell um, multi-unit buildings through co-op and dividend interest as well and condo. Um, so the basic requirements for the purchasing family. Um, the families do not need to be um, public housing residents. Um, they can be any low-income family in the community. However, the existing public housing family who's living in a unit um, that's sold does have a right of first refusal to purchase the home, even if that um, existing resident is over income. So generally, families have to be 80% and below uh, AMI or low income, but the existing family, if it's a low rent public housing unit, has a right of first refusal even if they're over income. Um, the, 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 the housing authority must maintain a wait list for the program or, or administer applications for the program that are separate from its low rent wait list. Um, so it, it is a separate application process to the housing authority or the PRE if they're implementing the sale. Um, but it, it, it's available to any low-income family in the community. Um, other basic requirements for families is they do have to be purchasing as their principal residence, and they also have to have a certain financial capacity. Um, and the regulation gets into some detail as to what HUD means by financial capacity, um, including an affordability standard um, where their housing costs will doesn't does not uh, cannot exceed 35% of their adjusted income. Um, so, so those are the basic requirements for the family. Um, the next component of a Section 32 program that's kind of really neat is if a housing authority doesn't have the capacity to go out and sell units on its own for affordable home ownership, it can partner with something the regulation calls a purchase and resale entity. So a housing authority could transfer all of the units that it's proposing to sell to um, another third party. And then that entity would have up to five years to sell them to the qualified low-income family. Um, and during this five years, the PRE could operate the units as public housing um, rental units and continue to get the op and cap fund or they could operate them outside of the public housing program as non-public housing rental um, until they're ready to sell them to the um, purchasing families or until there's interest and in, 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 uh, ability to sell them to the purchasing families. Um, so this is a great tool for, again, for PHAs that might have limited capacity to um, operate the program themselves, to partner with a PRE that has you know, the administrative um, capacity. The PRE could be a local nonprofit, it could be Habitat for Humanity, um, it could be a whole host of different partners. Um, so it's a great thing to keep in mind. Um, next component of Section 32, physical condition. Before the units are sold to the families, they have to meet local code, um, or if there is no local code, then housing quality standard, or HQS. So um, HUD it has an interest, a vested interest to make sure that 
the, the units are in good condition before the families buy, so they're set up for success in home ownership. Um, the ownership interest can be uh, fee simple, which is what we see vast majority of the time, um, especially with single family homes. Um, but it can also be condo, co-op, um, a, a lease purchase, um, uh, a shared appreciation interest with a PHA providing financing. So, so there's, there are various ownership models that the Section 32 program allows for. Um, recapture policies. Uh, under Section 32, the Housing Authority must have a policy to recapture some or all of the gains from appreciation and the below market assistance provided to the families if they sell in the first five years. Now, it doesn't provide for a particular percentage or amount that the Housing Authority has to recapture. The Housing Authority has considerable discretion here. It just has to have a policy that provides for, again, some or all of this appreciation and assistance in the first five years. So we've seen some housing authorities that, you know, re recapture a lot of it and other housing authorities that recapture just a very small portion, depending on the, their local plan and community and, and families. Um, and also the amount of assistance they, they're providing. Um, other application requirements in the 32 program uh, are very similar to what, you know, many of you are aware of in the Section 18 and Voluntary Conversion Program and that you know, the standard stuff like a board resolution, environmental review, inclusion in your PHA plan, and resident consultation are all part of the Section 32 application to the SAC. Um, the Section 32 program can also provide for financial assistance to the families um, as part of the Section 32 overall plan submitted to the SAC. So it would the first component would be the sale of these hard units, whether existing low rent units or whether newly acquired units. And then the second component of the um, Section 32 plan submitted to the SAC would, would, would say, and we want to, you know, again, set these families up for success by providing them with financial assistance um, to, to help them purchase the homes. So the financial assistance could include closing, cash for closing costs or down payments, um, now, the family is required to put down a small portion of the down payment with their own funds, but the Housing Authority could also supplement with um, some, some additional assistance. Um, or, and it can also be subordinate loans. Um, and we're going to get into kind of subordinate loans in, in, a, in a nice way to um, write down the, the, the value of the home, and Jane's going to get into that in a minute. But um, one thing to note here, and I believe Chris mentioned this earlier, is if the housing authority wants to use capital funds to provide closing costs, down payment assistance, or kind of cash for second loans, um, it, it, those families must be public housing families. But a housing authority could use proceeds from previous home ownership sales or non-1937 Act funds to provide this kind of financial assistance to any low-income family who is purchasing a home under the program. Um, relocation. So, for the, uh, let's start out with public housing units. So, if it's a public housing unit, as we've said, the, the um, current resident has the right of first refusal to purchase the unit, um, even if they're over income. So, in that case, no relocation of the family is required. However, the family could say, I don't want to purchase this home. I, I don't want to be a homeowner. And in that case, the um, current public housing family would uh, be entitled to relocation assistance. And the relocation assistance, again, is going to sound very familiar to the other SAC programs like Section 18 and Section 22, and that those non-purchasing families are entitled to comparable housing, um, typically another public housing unit or a Section 8 voucher for tenant-based or um, the ability to move to a project-based unit in, in another location. Um, one distinction in Section 32 is if the non-purchasing family um, is over income, then the 906 reg says that that over income family is entitled to uh, relocation assistance under the URA. 
So uh, Section 18, as many of you know, isn't quite that direct and explicit about um, that relocation for over-income families, but Section 32 says that over-income families who don't purchase are entitled to URA assistance. Um, the other time that URA might be applicable here is if a housing authority is purchasing uh, or acquiring non-public housing units to sell under a uh, Section 32 plan, and those units happen to be occupied. If those units that they're purchasing um, are occupied, then the families in those units are entitled to URA relocation assistance before the housing authority then sells them under the Section 32 plan. Um, other, other thing here, and, and this can really help with um, relocation of non-purchasing residents, um, the housing authority is entitled to, to receive tenant protection vouchers for all units occupied within the previous 24 months. Um, and, and this is true even if the family is purchasing, um, HUD will still provide replacement TPVs to the housing authority. And the, the, the rationale there is to replace the loss of rental assistance to the community. So this is really kind of fabulous in that a housing authority could use a Section 32 program to sell a low rent unit um, and increase the supply of affordable home ownership in their community. And then it would also get a replacement TPV to make up for that loss of rental assistance in the community. And then later on, it could also develop a new public housing unit because it would now have Faircloth authority um, to, to go out and develop a new public housing unit. So it can really utilize the Section 32 program to uh, increase the number of low-income families in the community it serves. Um, proceeds. Um, very similar to Section 18. That said, the, the wording of the reg is slightly different in the statute. So um, Section 18 says proceeds can be used for the provision of low-income housing. Um, proceeds under Section 32 must be used for purposes related to low-income housing and consistent with the PHA plan. So very, very similar eligible uses, um, which is really any housing under the Act. But as I previously mentioned, um, one thing we see PHAs doing with Section 32 proceeds a lot is using them to further their Section 32 program by going out and acquiring more units with the proceeds or using the proceeds to provide financial assistance to the non-public housing families. Um, and finally, HUD criteria. When a housing authority submits one of these, um, Section 32 plans to the SAC. So SAC will review the plan comprehensively and in it, the standard for approving or disapproving it, um, it comes down to the feasibility, the legal legality, and um, documentation the housing authority provides to evidence that they're gonna be able to successfully implement this and PHA past performance will we'll also um, see if there's any um, evidence of that. Um, and then finally, um, everything Kristen nicely outlined about the 8Y program uh, can be utilized as part of the sale of units under Section 32. So as long as you meet the requirements of both programs, um, then you can use the Section 8Y program um, to provide the assistance, including with the tenant protection vouchers um, as part of the sale under this program. Um, I think that's about it. I'm gonna go back to one thing I failed to mention under basic requirements. So we did talk about the low income requirement except for um, existing families which have the right of first refusal. We talked about principal residents and we talked about financial capacity, um, including the affordability standards. So these requirements are, re are required. There are also a bunch of optional things that are at the PHA discretion to include. So the PHA can have um, certain requirements about criminal activity um, uh, and exclude people with criminal activity backgrounds. Um, they can require homeownership counseling, but they don't have to. They can require employment, um, but they don't have to, unlike the Section 8 8Y program where employment, um, if I 
heard Kristen correctly, is required, and they can also require regular income, but again, not required um, as part of the Section 32 program. So that was a mouthful. I'm going to pause there, um, and we can um, either take questions on this program or move on until uh, we finish the slides here. Let's, let's go ahead and move. Well, I just have a few more things to say and a few more slides, and then we can open it up for questions. Um, just real quickly, um, when you're thinking about pricing a home, um, I want to really strongly suggest that you try to not write down the price. When you write the price down, it affects every house in that neighborhood. So that, you know, if you write your house down and say, we'll just take 20000 off the top, and therefore it's going to be $20,000 less. Mm -hmm. The next time your neighbor goes to a, goes to get an appraisal on their home, all of a sudden it's $20,000 less next door. So now their house is worth $20,000 less. So really need to try very hard to keep it, to keep the prices at fair market value. Um, to accomplish this, Clyde recommends using a, a forgivable loan. So rather than taking the $20,000 off the top, put in a, a forgivable loan for $20,000. And that can maintain the um, market value for the area. Um, we just want to make sure that that gets done. In terms of other tools and things to consider, choice neighborhoods, if you are fortunate to have a choice neighborhoods grant, um, you can service families up to 125% of AMI uh, with a 20-year use restriction. Um, so, and then as uh, Sue mentioned earlier, the rental assistance program, if you uh, take the assistance off of an existing unit um, under RAD, a transfer of assistance, that unit now has the DOT released. You can sell that unit for um, home ownership purposes. Uh, and, you know, however you want to do that, you can go ahead and do it. So we wanted to mention that here. Um, in terms of processing, these charts are in the, in the presentation today, just so you know who to send what to and where to inquire. Um, Section 32 obviously comes to the SAC. 8Y uh, goes to the, um, needs to be in your annual plan, it needs to be admin, admin plan, and that will eventually go up to um, Kristen's group, and then in the voucher office, and then a choice, you put it in your, uh, You'd submit a term sheet to your choice manager, um, and if you're going to do a transfer of assistance and vacate units, that needs to be part of your RAD application. Um, and I'll let you, at, at your own leisure, go through the rest of these. The chart continues on the next page to explain the various parts of the different programs. Um, this page has resources available. I'm sort of moving quickly, uh, Kayla. Whoops. All right, that was the processing chart. And then the next page is a continuation of the processing chart. And then we have a resource page as a final page. Right. So, okay, now we can go ahead and open up for questions. Okie doke. Uh, we've got quite a few. We've got about 25 left. So I'm just going to dive right in. And remember, you can either, for those who didn't, um, join from the beginning part of the session, you can either type your question in the chat box and send it to me, or you can raise your hand and ask your question out loud using the um, hand-shaped icon on the right-hand navigation panel. Also, just another reminder, because I've gotten a few questions about this, um, this session is being recorded and will be posted on HUD Exchange in the coming weeks, and all um, attendees today will receive a final copy of the slides, as well as an answer to a couple of the questions. I think that covers um, the questions that I can answer, so I will dive into the remaining questions. Um, can you explain more about switching back, or no, in a Section 32, selling public housing units for home ownership, can the PHA utilize home investment partnership program funds? Would Davis-Bacon be required due to the PHA ownership? 
So yes, you can use home. Um, Davis Bacon would be required because of the home funds um, under Section 32 as well. Uh, Davis Bacon is required. Is that right, Kathy? So. Yes, yes, Davis Bacon is required for rehab, repairs, and um, accessibility modifications um, performed to, to get the units in the uh, physical condition ready to rehab or ready to sell. Awesome, thank you. Next question. Can a PHA dispose of public housing scattered sites through Section 18 and sell properties to a first-time home buyer organization, for example, a land trust, and then receive TPVs through Section 18 and convert TPVs to an 8Y voucher to assist the converted public housing resident to stay in the unit? That was a pretty complicated one, so I'm going to put it in the chat um, so that you can read it as well. Okay, but the, the basic answer is yes. Um, okay. Yes, a housing authority can sell under Section 18 too. Um, and again, we, we encourage land trusts or, or Habitat for Humanity. Um, and uh, but we're going to look, and then you can take those those vouchers. You would get vouchers and. We can vouchers either way under Section 32 or under um, Section 30, uh, uh, Section 18. Either way, you would get vouchers, and those vouchers can be used um, in the 8Y program, but you still have to meet all the 8Y program uh, requirements as well as the Section 18 or Section 32 requirements. So that's the simple answer. Okay. okay. Thank you. Anyone wants to say more? Okay. Hearing nothing, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. Um, can a VASH voucher move over to home ownership? And then I have another VASH related question that I'm going to jump in here, lump in here. Would a VASH voucher still be coded as VASH if they move to home ownership? Would they still be considered VASH or would they? have to be moved to a regular voucher first? Yeah, so that question, um, they're actually doing a pilot program on that right now. Um, so I believe the answer is yes, but we haven't worked through that scenario before. Um, but, you know, as long as it meets the NASH requirements and the AY requirements, I believe it continues to be a HUD bash voucher that is then used for the homeownership option. Um, but, you know, if, if the PHA plans to do that, then definitely um, contact me and, you know, the field office to, to work through that. Thank you. Um, are environmental reviews required for all units? So at the moment, yes. Um, yeah, we're working on some potential changes to the environmental rules. But for now, yes, environmental reviews are required on everything. Um, if, the, if there's nothing changing within the building, it will more than likely convert to exempt. Um, but you got to still fill out the forms. OK, great, thanks. Um, yeah. Is the sale price counted as income if the family switches back to rental assistance or if they sell their home and use portability to continue under the home ownership program? So as with any home buyer, when you sell your house and you get a capital gain, it would be subject to whatever capital gain tax is in place at the moment. Um, I think it's a fairly lenient one at the moment, but they would still be subject to that. Um, I think the rule now is if you if you buy within two years, you don't have to pay it; it just rolls over. So I think it's okay. Yeah, okay. but it's thank you. Yeah, I did. I, I do want to say though. I think in a normal 
if if you're using non-federal funds to help with down payment assistance um, and you were to go back to your uh, forgivable mortgage idea, that money is taxable to the resident. I think federal money is not. So I think that's something to be wary of and something you should be working closely with a housing counselor to structure properly. But I do think the federal money is not taxable. Okay, thanks. Um, if a tenant sells their home and goes back to rental subsidy and the tenant decides to purchase again in the future, does their 15 years start over or does the time continue from previous home ownership? That's a great question. I think um, I think I have an answer for that, but I'm not sure. So let me send you. Let me look it up, and I will send um, something back in writing. When um, I can just send that to you, right? And then you can send that out when you post the slides. Or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can. I'll I can attach it to the um, okay. Okay. email. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. I will get back to you. Thanks. Um, next question. Can you get disability and still be able to apply for the program and do everything that is needed and required to be a first time homeowner? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that one more time? Yeah. Um, can you get disability and still be able to apply for the program and do everything that is needed and required to be a first time homeowner? I, be I believe so. I mean, you're not, you're not prohibited from receiving homeownership assistance if you receive disability. But wouldn't it depend on how much disability you were getting on a monthly basis and what you, whether you met the minimum requirements for the program? Yeah, so you would need to meet the minimum income requirement, which is um, about $9,500 annually. Um, so it's for um, an individual living alone. It's the SSI benefit for the individual living alone multiplied by 12. Um, and and then you need to meet the basic eligibility requirements for like the HCD program in general. So you couldn't be over income. So it's, it's possible. Okay, um, if there's nothing else, I can move on to the next question. Um, can you provide the title that covers the administration of the HCV homeownership program? Yes, it is. Ownership option is under nine eighty two six twenty five. It starts at six twenty five and goes to. 641. Okie doke. Thanks. Um, next, uh, this one is for you, Kathy. Did I hear you state that a TPV can be used to support home ownership? Yes. Um, if you receive um, HUD approval for 32 post rounds, uh, just a uh, reminder to my panelists to all be on mute if you're not speaking. I'm, I'm hearing some feedback. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Kathy. Sure. Um, so again, um, a housing authority, if they get approval for to sell units under a Section 32 plan, existing low-rent public housing units, the housing authority is eligible to receive 
tenant protection vouchers for all units that were occupied within the previous 24 months. So essentially, you know, selling the existing units um, as affordable home ownership and then getting a replacement TPV um, to um, add to your HCV renewable baseline. Um, and, and, and again, that TPV could be used by the uh, purchasing family um, to um, purchase their unit under the 8Y program if, if the Housing Authority has an 8Y program. Okay, thanks. Um, can residents access home ownership vouchers if they are on the wait list for a voucher? Yes, if they're on the wait list, then they're on the wait list and they can be selected to receive a home ownership voucher. Okay, thank you. What would the process be to convert Section 32 single family public housing homes to PBV or HCV home ownership units? So, um, the Section 32 program, you, can, you can't convert to PBV under Section 32 um, because that's not a home ownership interest. Um, but you could um, take the single family homes and convert them to uh, affordable home ownership units. Um, if you're looking to take single family homes and convert them to PBV, then you would have to apply under Section 18. So the, the future use could be rental and not home ownership. Um, and, and you would have to meet the requirements of the Section 18 program, um, which could include scattered site single family homes. So if you have a bunch of single family homes, then you have to determine what the best use for the community of those units is. Is it home ownership, in which case you'll apply under Section 32? If it's um, a, a rental units under a PVV platform instead of public housing, then you would apply under Section 18. In either case, you would be eligible for replacement TPVs um, if the units were occupied within the previous 24 months. Okay, thanks. And next question. Um, so I think another one for you, Kathy. Is there a template for lease to purchase contracts? Not as part of 906 or, or the reg. Um, no, so HUD doesn't have a standard form. Um, SAC would review it on a case-by-case -case basis as part of the Section 32 plan um, under the kind of the method of sale proposed, but no standard form. Okay, thank you. Um, should state and local landlord tenant law be considered in a lease to purchase contract? Absolutely. Yeah, as I said, definitely. <laughs> Great. Um, does the housing authority also have five years to sell the home if it does not use a PRE? And no, there's actually no time frame. So we have some uh, old, you know, 5-H programs, which is the predecessor to um, Section 32 and Turnkey 3, where housing authorities still have units in an approval that haven't been sold yet. So if the housing authority is uh, proposing units to sell itself under a Section 32 program, there's no time limit. So conceivably, they could keep the units under an approved Section 32 plan for over five years um, if they're making all efforts to sell them under the plan. Oh, I do want to note that that five year with working with the PRE is statutory. We have no way to waive that or to change that in any way. If the five year runs out, you got to end the program and you can restart it, but and start a new one. But you can't you can't keep that one going. So I just make that note. Okay. Next question: In calculating housing costs calculation for 35% of income, does one of the costs include a replacement reserve contribution? Could capital funds be used to seed a replacement reserve? I 
don't believe, and I, I don't need to look into this, whether the 35% um, includes a, a reserve. I don't think it does. Um, can you repeat that one more time, Kayla? Yeah, I'm pretty okay. sure it does not. Yeah. Yes. So I think yeah. when you're looking at 35% of income, you're looking at the full, the person's income. So there, I mean, you don't have replacement reserves in your income. Right, so you're looking at, it's 35% of the applicant's adjusted income and any subsidy that would be available for down payment. So it, that's, that's what we're looking for for the cost income ratio. The, the families, the applicant's adjusted income and any subsidy available to help pay with the, for the housing payment. So there's two factors. But I think what the okay. questioner is asking is there, um, could you include a replacement reserve as part of the ex housing expenses? Oh, okay, let's see. So Greg says um, the amount the applicant sent for mortgage, principal, and interest, plus insurance, real estate taxes, utilities, maintenance, and other regularly occurring home ownership costs, such as condo kind of co-op or other home ownership association fees. So it does say maintenance. Um, so it, depending on, you know, the details of that, I, I think it's possible that that could be considered a regular home ownership expense. Okay, thank you. Um, so roughly how many home ownership units does HUD see developed or sold via each of these programs annually? So um, there's a few uh, cities and towns that have active Section 32 programs. Um, and I'll speak to that from the SACS perspective and I'll let Kristen talk to AY. But um, I do know there's a couple cities that have used the housing authorities as land banks, um, and they've converted that to an active uh, Section 32 program, and they've been very successful. Um, I, I want to say there's about three or four of those. And then we have others that just have small inventories that they're looking to dispose of, that they've used Section 32 as an effective way to do so. Um, but we, you know, I think one thing that has come up since the 2008 um, recession has been the, the advent of land trusts. And we're seeing more and more land trusts coming into the picture um, and think that it's a good thing for the housing authorities to partner with the land trust and figure out how to do more affordable home ownership. So we encourage you to consider those. I'll let Kristen speak to you. Why? Yeah, so I'm just going to read a little blurb from a report that um, I just put together, and it really kind of paints a picture of, of what's going on with AY right now. Um, so in 2019, only 255 PHAs reported um, using homeownership voucher loans, and that's, con um, and that's compared to 491 in 2009. So so it's, it's really going down, unfortunately. Um, so on average, um, you know, there like every PHA is assisting 20 households per year. Um, you know, it's barely reached a thousand home closings in the past five years, um, which is down from an average of 2,000 closings per year from 2006 to 2009. So, so there's like a lot of barriers happening in the program with with AY. Um, so we want to support the use of this program, but we know that it's difficult. And I think some of the things that we've identified um, are, you know, about the local market. So the cost of housing in the area and then savings um, for closing costs and down payment. So again, that's why cultivating the relationships with the local lenders, other um, entities that provide subsidies for down payment and closing costs, such as the home program or other state programs, um, 
saving, I think some states have savings programs, you know, those, those are for the most part necessary to be tied to the AY program. So I hope I answered that question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next up, in a public housing home ownership scenario, can the PHA continue to own the underlying land and or retain a declaration of trust? Would the, TO, would the DOT need to be removed? Um, so, if you're converting to home ownership, um, once the house is sold, uh, the housing authority can retain the land. The DOT definitely has to be removed in any event. Um, but the housing authority can maintain the land and go under a ground lease, something similar to a land trust type of a scenario. Um, but again, you know, it's home ownership, so you want to do that or you want to sell the land too. So I think those are, but you, but the housing authority can retain the land. So the most typical scenario is that um, the housing authority sells the land um, and then the homeowner ends up owning the land. I don't think that my office has looked at any deals where there continued to be a ground lease and then the improvements were owned um, by an individual homeowner similar to a land trust. Yeah, we're just seeing our first one out in Denver, so it's starting. There's some interest out there. But yeah, and yeah, I, I I agree with what with what Jane said that the DOT definitely comes off. And in terms of whether again, there's these various ownership interests that are possible under a Section 32 plan, um, and we're and, and we think it's legally permissible to use like a land trust structure where the family would retain, you know, would would get an ownership interest in a unit or a share, and another entity would, like the land trust, would retain the land. Um, again, it, it, it seems it'll, it'll be tricky for the housing authority to retain the land, um, but I, I think it, depending on how it's structured, it, it could be a fe feasible. But, but generally, it'll be more like a land trust um, if it's a two-part ownership system. Okay, thanks. Um, Kristen, quick question for you about the report that you um, mentioned. Is that public yet? It is not. It will be. Um, we're still working on it. But I can say we're also working on developing a dashboard for the AY program so um, more data could be accessible. Um, it's, it certainly, you know, wasn't wasn't um, talked about for a long time, and, and now there's definitely more interest in it, and um, you know we want to support that interest. So, okay, thanks so much. We've got I got 13 questions in my queue, so we'll keep chugging along. Um, if no sale, can the house be returned? If the house isn't sold, can it be returned to public housing? Yes, it can. Um, notify the field office in the SAC, and we, and you'd have to um, at least get a board resolution saying that you definitely want to take it back into public housing, and we can convert it back. Assuming but, you haven't sold it already to a PRE well, or something else. Right? Yeah. So, so just to add on to that, if the housing authority under the Section 32 plan is proposing to sell directly, then the housing authority is always public housing. It, it remains low rent public housing until sold, so there's no reason to convert it back or, or, or no requirement to convert it back. It just is, continues to be public housing until sold. If it's transferred to the PRE and the PRE is unable to sell it in that first, in that five year period, then yes, it, it, it returns to the housing authority and when it returns to the housing authority, the housing authority has to make a decision whether it's going to try to continue to sell that unit itself under the 32 plan or whether it wants to return that unit to the low rent inventory. And as Jane said, if the decision is to return it to the low rent inventory, then um, likely we'll need some limited um, 
you know, development proposal to bring it back in or, or some process to bring it back into the low rent inventory so it's eligible um, for subsidy again if, if the PRE was operating it as a non-public housing unit. Oops, I'm on mute. Okay. Um, next question, how do we apply for the TPVs? Is it automatic? And then another TPV question, is the non-purchasing over income resident eligible for a TPV for relocation? So um, the TPV is not automatic. It's the same, it's same as with Section 18. After getting the SAC approval of the Section 32 plan, the Housing Authority can apply for the TPVs under the separate process. Um, and regarding the over income family, no. Um, to be eligible for a TPV, the family has to be income eligible. Um, and if it's a non-purchasing over income resident, then 906 provides that they are entitled to relocation assistance under the URA um, in lieu of that TPV. Okay, next question. Can capital funds be used to support a staff member to create and manage one of these programs? So this is Chris. The, um, there, there's a few ways that you could accomplish something like that. So you can pay for um, in-house staff to manage through um, admin. So cap funds go up to 10% admin that can be used for salaries, um, and that can be that can go towards home ownership. Um, you can also use funds to pay for um, operations through 1406. That's where capital funds go towards operating costs, and that can also be used towards salaries. And then you can use um, something called management improvements under 1408 budget line item, and that's where capital funds can be used by housing authority to address some kind of a management deficiency. So um, there's a few ways to, to cover something like that. You would not necessarily um, pay for an entire staff person, but you would be able to pay for, um, if a staff person worked on this program, you, you could prorate their time and cover it with cap funds through one of the budget line items that I mentioned. And um, if you wanna kind of get an idea of how to do that, we can take a look at Epic when it comes to when it comes time to actually do it, we can take a look at Epic and we can show you how to um, how to budget those correctly. All right, thank you. Next up, what is the benefit of a home ownership program under Section 32 versus a disposition under Section 18 to an entity that will sell units to income eligible home buyers? I'll let James so, talk. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ken. I was just going to say the, the, the Section 32 program just has a lot of really great provisions on both protecting the families that are buying with these um, kind of affordability standards and um, allowing the housing authority to use cap funds and other financing um, to provide financial assistance to the families to get them in a position to be um, in a good position to be home buyer, homeowners. Um, it also allows, you know, housing authorities to use um, cap funds to get the, the units up in good physical condition. So they're, they're ready to be sold to families and to rehab the units that will be sold. Um, and I just think it's, it, it, it's more akin to RAT, like it's a nice package. It, 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 it oversees the whole process from physical condition of the units through um, sale and financing to the families. Whereas Section 18, to, it just isn't as comprehensive as a, of a package and a program. 
if your goal is to sell existing units under Section 32. Um, beyond that, I think the, the bar is pretty high under the SAC commensurate public benefit standard um, to make us feel comfortable um, that you've kind of evidenced a sufficient commensurate public benefit to sell existing units um, uh, through 18 versus going through the Section 32 program. And Jane, please add or correct. Right, so I, that's the, the, the major difference is, is under Section 18, we're going to be very um, careful about the commensurate public benefit. Uh, so that, I mean, you're going to have to figure out a, a, a strong way to show us that this is in fact going to end up in the, uh, you know, that um, affordable, you know, that low-income buyers are going to be actually be purchasing these homes. That there's not, you know, there's not going to be, you know, and then, and then, so I think that gets a lot more complicated and a lot more to, harder to do under Section 18 than it does under Section 32. We're a lot more comfortable with 32 going forward for home ownership. Okay, if there's nothing else to add there, we can move on. Um, where can I obtain training for underwriting standards? That's a great question. Um, so, I think, so if you look into the home program, they have underwriting standards. And if you look on the HUD exchange, they might have some resources for underwriting standards. Um, that's where I would start. All right, thank you. Can you recommend income slash employment standards for HOV applicants? And are there standards required by HUD or are they up to each PHA's discretion? So there are income and employment requirements, um, and they're listed on the PowerPoint and in the regulations. Uh, PHAs do have the discretion to um, make them more restrictive than what is in the regulation, and we um, recommend looking at, um, you know, what your local lenders are requiring for uh, homeownership and mortgage assistance, um, you know, it can it can be different depending on if they're going to purchase from Habitat or a local credit union is providing a loan or, you know, Chase Bank. So um, I think housing, yeah, housing counseling agencies and housing counselors would be good resources to um, identify those types of um, partnerships with the programs for employment and income. Okay, um, can a public housing resident that is not on the HCVP waiting list receive a voucher for home ownership without having to get on the waiting list if they have been qualified to purchase? No, they have to be a current voucher participant or selected from the wait list, unless it's a TPV situation. Their vouchers just like any other vouchers. They're just used for home ownership. Okay, thank you. Um, can a PHA have a policy to require that participants be in the HCV program for at least a year before receiving home ownership assistance? I believe so. Um, let me follow up to get you something in writing, but I don't, I don't see why not, because they can put more restrictions on the program. So that's a maybe, but I'll, I'll find out. Okay, awesome. Um, what happens to the housing authority if the homeowner goes into default on the loan? Also, if the homeowner wishes to no longer have the home and wants to go back to the voucher program, what happens to the housing authority as it relates to the home? So I've had this question before. Um, 
and I can't think of like the exact words I should use off the top of my head, but it's, I mean, they can convert to a rental assistance voucher if they still qualify. Um, but I can, I can follow up with a more comprehensive response as well on that one. But they don't lose their assistance. This is a follow up on the wait list um, conversation and question. Um, I guess to your response. So, why are we saying that the applicants can be selected from the wait list to utilize a home ownership voucher? As opposed to, I guess it's like as opposed to what? Being current voucher participants or not on the wait list? Yeah, I'll ask that um, question after to follow up if they, oh, the HCVP waitlist. Yeah, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Okay, maybe try uh, the, for the asker, maybe just try reframing um, and I'll get back to that question because we have a few more. Um, next, can FSS funds be applied to home ownership vouchers or just rental vouchers? So I'm not an expert on FSSS, but I know that the programs are combined and basically that money that gets put into escrow can go towards um, the purchase of a home. So, it, but, it, and it's their money. So I think the question they're asking is like, in addition to the voucher, maybe their continued monthly payment. Um, but you, usually that money in the FSS program is, is put towards the down payment or um, closing costs up front. And then that half payment will then be what the home buyer uses on a monthly basis to pay their mortgage. Okay. Um, next, I have seven um, LIPH condo units that do not meet the definition for Section 18 scattered, scattered sites. The units are not getting enough subsidy to, to sustain themselves. Can I sell? or dispose of them under Section 32 to my nonprofit and receive TPVs to be for home ownership? If so, how long does this process typically take? So you can't sell them to your nonprofit under Section 32 because your nonprofit is not a low-income family. Um, your nonprofit could serve as the purchase and resale entity and then it would have up to five years to sell them to eligible low-income families. Um, so these units, if, if they qualify, uh, if you can figure out how to give an ownership interest in these units that would be an eligible form of ownership interest under Section 32, conceivably the units at issue could be home ownership units under a Section 32 plan. Um, but they would need their, either need to be sold directly to low-income families um, for home ownership, or they would need to be sold through a purchase and resale entity that could include your nonprofit to low-income fam families for home ownership. I'm not sure if that answered okay. your question. If it didn't, please ask again. Yes, follow up in the chat. Um, do you need the public housing units that you're going to make sec or do you need to put the public housing units that you're going to make section 32 in the RAD application? So the, the, you don't need section 32 approval if you have former public housing units where the assistance has been transferred through a RAD conversion. If you have former public housing units where the assistance has been converted under RAD, then as part of your RAD application and proposal, you can say to recap, okay, now that I've transferred the assistance off site um, for RAD, I have these vacant, empty public housing units um, that are still under a DOT. Um, recap, will you please authorize the release of the DOT so that I can sell them under um, a local home ownership plan um, to low-income families for affordable home ownership. And RECAP will review that plan um, under 
it's um, affordable housing purposes um, kind of language in the RAD notice and if it concurs that the future use of those properties for affordable home ownership meets the requirements of affordable housing purposes, which it likely will, then HUD will authorize release the DOT and authorize you to um, sell those units either directly or through a community partner for affordable home ownership. All right, thank you. Um, so for PHAs that partner with land trust or Habitat for Humanity to develop home ownership units, what is the procurement method adopted for working with such organizations? Does it have to be an open procurement through a request for proposals, or is there a way to directly work with the land trust or Habitat for Humanity? So I, I think it depends on the program you propose work under and, and the structure of the program. So I think it's kind of a case-by-case -case thing. Um, under, if you submit this under Section 32 um, and are using Habitat, for instance, as a purchase and resale entity, then that uh, you would just need to meet the requirements of 906 about the finance, evidencing the financial and administrative capacity of Habitat to sell those units um, to low-income families. And, and including Habitat could possibly rehab them along the way before selling them if it's part of your agreement with the um, PRE under 906. But I don't think you would need to comply with the standard public housing procurement rules. Instead, you would comply with the PRE rules in 906. Um, in another instance, you, you might have to work under the public housing procurement rules, again, depending on when you would engage um, a partnership um, as part of one of these programs. I, others might have other, other thoughts on procurement. Yeah, you may have, it, it, it may be that you need, um, and you also should check your local procurement rules as well, local or state procurement rules. Um, you may have to go through a sole procurement, a sole individual so that you can do that because they're unique organizations that have, that are, you know, Land trusts more often than not have a government sponsor. So um, I think you probably could do a sole, you know, a sole thing, sole procurement versus yeah. doing yeah, go ahead. Kayla, is that, is that question in the chat? Uh, yes, it's in the chat, but I think it was just sent directly to me. Um, yeah, that was just sent to me. Okay, could, if you could just send it. But I, again, I, I think it, everyone, yes. Yeah, it, 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 it would depend on the actual structure of the program in terms of the applicable procurement requirements. Okay. For the, um, well, for the AY program, it, I mean, it's it's a housing choice voucher, so they're selecting the unit, but as for like administrative duties of carrying out PHA functions, they would need to follow procurement policies for, um, you know, contracting those administrative duties. I don't know if that answers the question on that side. Okay, um, so we've got four more questions, about nine minutes left, so I think we should be able to get through all of these. Thanks everyone for all your great questions, and if you hop off before you know, the end of the session, just remember to please fill out the survey for us at the end. Okay, next question. Um, does an FSS participant have to use their escrow funds if the assistance is available through the PHA? Is this the Section 32 program or 8Y? I believe Section 32. So do they, the question is, do they have to use their FSS? Here's I will the have, I will ask that person to, to clarify in the chat and we'll move on to the next question while they do that. Um, okay, no, the PHA cannot mandate FSS escrows to be used for the purchase of a 
Um, I think that was just a comment. <laughs> um, okay, next question. Um, and we'll wait for the but, question asker to clarify there, unless you have something, Kathy. Uh, I, I was just, I, I kind of agree with the comment that, you know, FSS may be available if it meets the FSS requirements, but there's nothing in Section 32 that says that FSS funds must be used as part of the financing um, from the family. Okay, thanks. So this is a follow-up about um, the waiting list and vouchers, um, the clarifying points there. So are you saying that families who have been pulled off of the Housing Choice Voucher Program waitlist and approved can decide that they want to utilize a home ownership voucher instead of a regular voucher? What if the Housing Authority maintains a separate home ownership waitlist? So you can't, main, you cannot maintain a separate home ownership waitlist. Um, so, and then if they're pulled off and accepted, um, then they would have to meet the additional criteria that the PHA sets on the home ownership program and then the based criteria, um, regulatory criteria, like the income and employment. So again, housing vouchers are, and the home ownership option is just like any other regular voucher. It's one wait list. Got it. Thank you. Um, so they just clarified that they don't maintain a separate home ownership wait list. It's just a list of interested folks. No um, but <laughs> um, next question, what are the legal concerns with land trusts rooted in? Does HUD need to see the documents showing the sale contract to the end buyer? Can you repeat that? I'm trying to figure out if it's a yeah, yeah. question. What are the legal concerns with land trusts rooted in? Does HUD need to see documents showing the sale contract to the end buyer? I do think that the, I think that the local field offices will review, their council will review the final sale documents, yes. So we would want to see what the final, and know what restrictions are on those home buyers. I mean, clearly here, what we're looking to do is build wealth for these individuals um, and still protect the housing authority's interests and um, the land trust interests. So I think we do want to see those. And for AY, right. the PHA needs to review the contract of sale. And it's, it's in the regulations and there's a couple um, criteria for that. So, and again, it's about you know, protecting the buyer. Right. Yeah. So again, 906 doesn't directly address land trust as a possible ownership structure, but it's open enough that it says, you know, a, a fee simple, a condo, a limited dividend co-op, shared appreciation interest, or lease hold and a lease purchase agreement are all possible ownership options, but it, the, the list is non-exclusive. Non so a housing authority could propose um, an ownership structure that includes a land trust, again, retaining the, the, the fee title of the, of the land itself. And SAC would review that on a case-by-case -case basis under the Section 32 plan. And as Jane said, we'd probably tap into the expertise of the field office to um, review some of the land trust documents uh, as part of that ownership structure. Yeah, and I would just add, I don't think that there's any, you know, issues or concerns about it. I think just the ownership structure is, is complicated with all of the um, regulations for program eligibility and, and um, sale and, and things like that. So it, it's, it's just more complex. Okay, a couple questions left. Um, so just going to try to get through these quickly. Um, does the PRE have to be identified in the Section 32 application? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and, and there's a whole, uh, a, a bunch of additional requirements if a, if a housing authority is use, utilizing a PRE um, that have to be included as part of the Section 32 plan, including the agreements between the housing authority and the PRE and the demonstration that the PRE has the financial and legal capacity to, um, um, operate and sell the units um, for to, to families under the plan. 
Okay. Is there any guidance available to explain the difference in emergency housing vouchers and regular Section 8 vouchers? Yeah, so I, will, I can just put in the chat. So there's an emergency housing vouchers website um, specifically. So um, that's going to have all the information. And then there is uh, a notice that talks about those big differences. And I will put um, that link into the chat for anyone to access. Great, thank you. And this is our final question. We'll round this out nicely. Um, really great questions today. We, got, we had over 50. So thanks to everyone for joining and participating. Um, so last question, why are emergency housing vouchers not able to be used for home ownership? How are they different from Section 8 home ownership vouchers? Um, so I'm not the expert in emergency housing vouchers, but um, I did check with that SME and it's, I mean, I think it's just prohibited based on the notice that rules those vouchers. Um, so I can't say for certain, but I will, um, I can send out the notice that talks about those discrepancies and the um, regulation, or not the regulations, but the criteria around the, um, how they're supposed to be administered. And it's just a different program. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Um, so I think that wraps us up with a minute to spare. Um, again, just want to remind folks to take this survey. Um, as it pops up on your screen, it'll pop up in your browser. Um, so just take a moment to fill that out with any um, suggestions for us. We definitely look at those. Um, and thanks again for your participation. Jane, I'll pass it over to you for any closing remarks. Thank you, Kayla. And thanks everybody for participating today. Um, clearly there's a lot of interest here with a lot of questions. We tried to address what we could, but we may not have gotten all of the answers out that you wanted. Um, this is helpful guidance for us as we begin to look at other options, you know, as we look at trying to provide more guidance to you. So we will use the questions that we got today um, to fashion some further guidance for you. Uh, so we really thank everyone's participation today. It was very, very helpful. Um, I think that's it. All right, everyone, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody.